Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. I will go over just a couple housekeeping items before I introduce our speaker. And I will also cover these again at the end of the webinar. So we have changed the uh, method of evaluation. Uh, after today's webinar, within four hours, you will receive an evaluation. You will also be sent a certificate saying that you completed the webinar. That certificate is not a continuing education certificate. This program has been approved for one contact hour of continuing education. The continuing education certificate will be forwarded to you about two weeks following the webinar. So please don't call anybody asking for the CE certificate. That comes two weeks later. This is part of a grant sponsored by uh, SAMHSA in collaboration with the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, its Providers Clinical Support System. And the International Nurses Society on Addictions is one of the members on this grant. And each year, we do four webinars related to the opioid epidemic. This is the first year now of a new grant cycle. Uh, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry was refunded uh, beginning in August of this year, and it will be through another three-year cycle. And we'll talk more about that grant towards the end of the program as well. So let me introduce our speaker. I feel very honored to have Dr. Laura Bamford here. Dr. Bamford is a clinical associate professor of medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She has an excellent background in HIV medicine, as well as other issues that confront certainly people who abuse substances. So the title of her presentation today is The Opioid Epidemic and Complications of Injection Drug Use. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bamford. I will probably cover a couple slides on the grant, and then she will fully take over. So Dr. Bamford, welcome. Thank you, Al. Um, so first I'll start um, with my disclosures. Here they are. Um, and this is the now the grant. Audience. Yep, the target audience is to train a diverse range of healthcare professionals in the safe and effective prescribing of opioid medications for the treatment of pain as well as the treatment of substance use disorders, particularly opioid use disorders with medication assisted treatments. And here are the um, educational objectives um, for today. So, first, to describe the epidemiology of the opioid crisis and then uh, to discuss the complications of injection drug use with particular uh, emphasis on HIV and hepatitis C. And then finally, describe the tools that we can all use to combat the opioid crisis and the complications of injection drug use. So to start, um, I first wanna talk about and the increase in heroin use in the United States that's now um, and it caused this catastrophic you know, opioid crisis. And this first slide, which comes from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, kind of outlines where heroin use has increased. It's really increased among most demographic groups in the United States. So it does not discriminate, and you know, independent of sex and age, race, ethnicity, annual household income, and even health insurance status, we've seen increases in, in heroin use in this country. Um, and the first complication, um, and again, perhaps the most catastrophic, is the increase in, in overdose deaths that we've seen in, in the United States um, you know, since 1999 and then culminating in, in 2017 with 70,237 total deaths, uh, which you can see in the, the blue kind of turquoise line really driven by synthetic opioids, which is fentanyl. And you know, we all know that fentanyl is 50 to 100 times as potent as heroin, and that's why it's driving these opioid deaths. And one, one, uh, two other things I wanna point out on this slide is that somewhere between 2013 and 2000, sorry, 2014 and 2015, you can see that you know that Army Green Line and then that Kelly Green Line crossed, and that's where heroin surpassed. You can see the natural and semi-synthetic opioids. So there's a prescription opioid. That's where heroin surpassed prescription opioids. 
um, in overdose deaths. And then again, between 2015 and 2016, you can see that turquoise line crossing the army green line of, of heroin, and that's where fentanyl surpassed heroin in driving uh, the opioid deaths in this country. Um, and you can see on this slide where these overdose deaths are occurring. And you know, the darker blue, you can see these are areas in the United States with statistically higher death rates compared to the you know, overall um, standard rate in, in the U.S. This is really in you know, the northeast uh, part of, of the United States. And if you were to overlay a map you know, on top of this of where most prescription opioids were prescribed in the U.S., it would look very similar. So you know, it's clear that you know, previous prescription opioids were really driving now the opioid epidemic and the overdose um, deaths in this country. Um, and then, you know, on to, you know, I'm here in Philadelphia. So where where does Philadelphia rank um, compared to um, the ten largest um, ten largest U.S. cities that are associated with with counties? And you can see Philadelphia far surpasses the other ten um, with a crude death rate here of um, 65 per 100,000 residents. And that, you know, very unfortunately, is far outpaced. Uh, piece Chicago, um, which has 23 deaths per 100,000 residents, and this was in, in 2017. Um, and to put um, you know, these deaths in some uh, perspective, you know, I you know, already showed you the death rate um, from 2017, so these are 2015 numbers, and you know, that 52,404 numbers I've already demonstrated you know, is far higher in, in 2017. But you know, again, to put this in perspective with um, some other epidemics and other preventable causes of death, you can see that opioid deaths or drug-related deaths have far you know, outpaced uh, deaths from HIV AIDS, which peaked in 1995, and also car crashes, gun deaths, and gun homicides in, in 2015. Now, the numbers, you know, this isn't all doom and gloom, and um, fortunately in 2018, and, and these are um, still um, just uh, uh, prospective numbers or predicted numbers and not completely confirmed, but in 2018, um, the United States is predicted to have had 68,557 deaths, so the first decline um, since 1999. Um, now, you know, it's small and perhaps only 5% and again, still just predicted, but, you know, we're hopeful that um, all the efforts that have been done on education and Narcan distribution um, are really starting um, to, to turn the corner um, and, you know, in particularly in the, the northeastern part of the United States. So one, one disturbing um, piece from this slide is that there are areas in orange which, um, do rep represent increasing overdose deaths, particularly in parts of the country where we haven't seen large numbers of deaths. And so that's in the South and the Southwest. And, and the concern is, you know, well, fentanyl is really um, driving you know, the illicit opioid market in the Northeast. It hasn't hit other parts of the United States, you know, particularly in the West where they have black tar heroin and fentanyl hasn't been, been easily mixed into the supply there or adulterated the supply there. So the concern is, you know, has fentanyl made it into other um, illicit substances in other parts of the country like cocaine and, and crystal meth? So I think still a little bit early to know, but um, you know, there is some uh, clearly some concern um, based on these numbers. Um, so now I want to talk about um, some of the infectious complications of injection drug use. And before I do that, I think important to define like what injection drug use is, because how people are in injecting the drugs really determines what kinds of infections or where the infections are located um, that they may be at risk for. So um, you know, individuals either inject drugs into veins, or into arteries called mainlining, um, you know, which can lead to bloodstream infections and endocarditis. Um, folks either uh, intentionally inject subcutaneously or intradermally or may miss a vein and then um, inject that way. 
um, also known as skin popping, um, are finally intramuscularly and either, again, intentionally or um, you know, after missing a vein or going too deep in the skin, uh, folks may inject into a muscle, which is called muscle popping or muscling. And, and obviously, you know, based on how people are injecting, determines where they may introduce bacteria that, that shouldn't you know, belong there. Um, so some of the uh, medical complications. So first, um, viral infections or um, the bloodborne infections like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Um, we're also seeing increases in hepatitis A infections, which aren't bloodborne but are um, fecal oral, uh, fecal orally transmitted. And, and the reason for that is often when when individuals are injecting drugs, they may be living or hanging out in areas that aren't particularly hygienic and therefore um, can transmit hepatitis A from one person to another. And we've had outbreaks here in Philadelphia and, and I know other parts of the country also in, in people um, who inject drugs. Um, skin and soft tissue infections are another complication and those include um, abscesses, cellulitis, um, septic thrombophlebitis, um, there can be pulmonary complications, including community acquired pneumonia and pulmonary tuberculosis. Again, for, for similar reasons why we're seeing more hepatitis A when people are crowded and kind of more unsanitary conditions close together, um, pneumonia and tuberculosis can be spread from one person to another. Uh, we can see foreign body granulomatosis. Um, and depending on what the illicit substances are cut with or what the fillers are, you know, they can be things that uh, can go to the lungs um, and, and, uh, and other places to the eyes, but you know, cause granulomas as a foreign substance that you know, it, um, kind of holds up there. Um, we can see septic emboli, um, particularly in individuals with endocarditis or um, thrombophlebitis or septic thrombophlebitis. Um, the cardiovascular complications include infective endocarditis, lymphedema, um, particularly in the you know, legs, sometimes in the arms, but all veins have valves in them. And as uh, needles are inserted into veins, it can disrupt those valves and prevent um, fluid you know, uh, from the extremities, uh, prevent it from returning to, to um, the endovascular space. Um, thrombophlebitis, you know, even in the absence of an infection with septic thrombophlebitis, just from you know, re repeatedly accessing a vein. Um, you can see epidural abscesses and brain abscesses as um, CNS complications, splenic abscesses as part of lymphatic system complications, um, and then the endovascular complications, bloodstream infections, pseudoaneurysms if individuals are intentionally or accidentally injecting into arteries. Um, we can see deep venous thromboses, um, particularly when um, if people are repeatedly going into the same vein you know, because of the inflammation and the, the thrombophlebitis. Um, muscul musculoskeletal complications include psoas abscesses, septic arthritis, osteomyelitis, and tenosynovitis. Um, and then we've been seeing a lot of iron deficiency anemia, and you know, often in very young people, um, young men, um, and just from repeated blood loss um, you know, during in injection drug use practices. Um, one other kind of more uh, recently recognized complication, um, a renal complication, is AA or secondary amyloidosis. Um, and you know, thought secondary to just repeated infections and inflammation, um, or just repeated inflammation from you know, chronic injection. And then finally, um, you know, people who inject drugs are at high risk for sexually transmitted infections, um, either because there's um, you know, sex work or, or transactional sex going on, or um, just high risk sex because people under the influence of substances aren't um, protecting themselves. Um, our folks, uh, our patients you know, experience a lot of violence. Um, you know, assaults are on the rise here in Philadelphia um, related to substance use. And then trauma, you know, either psychological trauma from years of um, injection drug use or being on the street and even in physical trauma um, from accidents under the influence of, of a substance. Um, so I'm going to delve in now a little bit more to each of those complications. So, um, 
you know, where, where do these infections come from? So um, it can be back, both bacterial and fungal infections, and you know, the bacteria and fungi live on the surface of the skin. Um, so it's one way they can be introduced into the bloodstream or the subcutaneous space or into muscles. Um, bacteria live in saliva, and it's not uncommon practice for individuals who inject drugs to either lick their syringes, you know, to lubricate, sorry, lick their needles to lubricate them before injection or, or blow into the barrel of a syringe to, to clear it out. And so that's how bacteria in the mouth can, can in, get introduced where it shouldn't go. Um, there can be bacteria and fungi in the drug itself or in the diluents. Um, so in the water um, that's used um, to you know, dissolve the drugs uh, enabled to enable people to inject them. And you know, only um, you know, tap water and bottle water bottled water and not sterile you know, really you know patients either need to use sterile water or bottle or boil water for 10 minutes um, for it to be free of bacteria and fungi um, in the filters themselves in the cotton um, that's used you know, bacteria and fungi can also accumulate there and then be introduced um, where they shouldn't go um, again into either the subcutaneous tissues tissues into the muscles or, or into the bloodstream um, people who inject drugs are 16.3 times more likely to develop invasive uh, MRSA infections compared to the general population. And we've seen increases in hospitalizations um, for serious bacterial infections, uh, including skin and soft tissue infections, infective endocarditis, um, epidural abscess, and osteomyelitis. All of these are, are on the rise in people who inject drugs in the United States. And uh, just a quick review of um, injection drug use equipment, and again, um, you know, all of these, um, all of these uh, implements that are used for injection drug use can all result in the transmission of bacteria or fungi or viruses from one person to another. So now, first, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the individual and uh, most common infections. So, skin and soft tissue infections. Um, are the most common medical complication in people who inject drugs and are actually the top reason um, for hospitalizations in this population. And it's estimated that between 6% and 32% of indi individuals who inject drugs will have a skin and soft tissue infection at any given time, so an abscess or, or cellulitis. And risk factors um, include female sex, um, largely because you know uh, women you know probably don't access um, syringe service programs as much as men often have competing needs you know child care elder care that prevents them from taking care of their own health um, frequent injection um, which is obvious um, inadequate skin cleaning um, injecting subcutaneously or intramuscularly is riskier than, than injecting uh, into a vein, um, and then people living with HIV are at higher risk of these complications, and also individuals who share needles. Um, Staph aureus and group A strep are the most common pathogens, but oral flora, for the reasons I mentioned of you know, licking needles or blowing into the barrel of syringes, um, also can be seen um, as can pseudomonas, which um, can contaminate water that's not sterile or boiled, and also gram-negative um, bacteria um, that, again, can contaminate water, um, if not sterile, can also be seen. Right, so now on to um, infectious endocarditis. So compared with the general population, Staph aureus is the most common cause of infective endocarditis um, in this population. Um, which re represents 68% of all cases of endocarditis um, compared to 28% in the general population. And um, you know, the bacteria in this population more often involves the right-sided valves, um, although um, you can still see you know, left-sided endocarditis. Um, streptococci and enterococci are the next most common pathogens, um, and less commonly fungal infections and gram-negative infections can cause endocarditis in this population. Um, and people who inject drugs have higher rates of reinfection, um, mostly because the valve is likely you know, is already damaged from a previous um, from a previous episode, and, and especially if there's ongoing um, injection drug use, and also higher rates of valve-related complications. 
um, likely related to the fact that this population tends to prevent present late to care, um, you know, once there's already been significant valve damage. Now uh, we're going to switch gears and talk um, a bit about HIV infection in, in this population. So this is um, a, a study, it's the results of the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Study, and it was conducted by the CDC in 20 cities in the United States in, in 2015. So 27% of HIV negative respondents in this study reported receptive sharing of syringes in the previous 12 months. Um, and receptive sharing was higher among whites um, compared to Latinos and blacks. 49% um, reported receptive sharing of other injection equipment, so cookers, tourniquets, filters, um, with the same pattern by race, you know, with higher rates in whites um, compared to Latinos and blacks. And despite you know, this risky behavior, um, only about half this population received syringes from a syringe service program. Um, and a little over half were screened for HIV um, during you know, the time period of the study, which was a year. Um, so this is some data from the CDC. These are um, you know, HIV incidence rates by year. Um, and you can see, so in the turquoise line is um, you know, new HIV infections um, by injection drug use. So back in 1993 is when it was the peak of new infections in the United States. And at that time, about a third of all um, new infections were attributable to injection drug use. And through great public health efforts and syringe service programs and education, um, that rate has been reduced to 9% um, as of 2016. So about 6% um, it's purely related to injection drug use alone, another 3% um, it's a combination of male-to-male um, -male sexual contact and, and injection drug use. Um, but you know, despite um, you know, these great efforts, um, there's a concern now that um, you know, some of that these prevention efforts are being reversed, and there have been um, outbreaks of HIV in a um, number of uh, locations in the United States, including Indiana and Seattle and West Virginia and Massachusetts. Um, and this was the outbreak from Indiana, um, from Scott County, Indiana in particular, in red, uh, the red circle. And Scott County, Indiana um, has, some of, has the lowest life expectancy in Indiana, high unemployment rates, um, high poverty rates, um, low um, high school graduation rates, and um, many uninsured. Um, and back in 2014, um, though, there were no known cases of HIV in this county. Um, and then um, a prescription opioid called Opana came along, and um, the manufacturers of Opana um, in order to prevent its misuse by, inter by intranasal use, they coated a panna with this latex capsule. Um, but you know, the occupants of, of Scott County, Indiana, figured out that if you actually um, you know, diluted this and cooked it um, in water, the latex capsule would float away and then it would allow the panna to be injected. And there were houses in, in uh, Austin City in Scott County, Indiana, where people would go and you know, many people a day using the same cooker, often the same injection equipment. And this county that had zero HIV infections in 2014 um, had 225 um, as of April 1st, 2018. Um, so, um, you know, a very large like you know, public health crisis. And then, you know, here's the story in Philadelphia. So similar to the, the national numbers, um, you know, back in 1992, um, half of all um, new HIV infections that year were attributed to injection drug use. And again, through, you know, tremendous public health campaign, you know, education about not sharing injection equipment and the opening of a syringe service program in Philadelphia that year, by 2016, we've reduced 
um, the number of new infections uh, attributed to injection drug use in Philadelphia to 33, and uh, only 5.2% of, of the total. Um, and that um, was until the last two years. So again, you can see the 2016 numbers of 33 um, new infections. And now, um, since then, we've seen a 115% increase in what we think are new HIV infections um, in people who inject drugs since 20, uh, 2016. Um, and you know, there's concern that the two, you can see the 2017 and the 2018 numbers, and there's concern that the 2019 numbers are now even worse. As of June, um, we've seen 43 um, confirmed um, new infections um, in people who inject drugs. Um, and then in addition to um, these new infections, um, there's also uh, an increase in opioid over death, overdose deaths among persons um, with HIV in the United States. And this is um, uh, an oral abstract that was uh, presented at the Conference on Retroviruses and Operatives and Infections from the CDC um, back in March of this year. So overall mortality uh, among people living with HIV was 12.7 percent less in 2015 um, compared to 2011, um, with the exception of um, deaths related to opioid overdose. Um, so the opioid overdose death rate among persons with diagnosed HIV was 42 percent uh, greater in 2015 than in 2011, and rates of opioid overdose deaths were higher for all subgroups examined by age, sex, race, ethnicity, transmission category, and um, even region of the United States, with the exception of the Western United States. Um, and deaths were highest among persons um, aged 50 to 59, um, females, whites, people who inject drugs, and then in the Northeast, um, as I showed you previously, is where. Um, you know, the deaths have really been localized in the United States. In addition to um, increases in um, new HIV infections, um, we've also seen um, a tripling of new, HIV, new hepatitis C infections um, in the United States between 2011 and 2016, which we think is you know, attributed uh, to the opioid epidemic because as um, it's hepatitis C infections have increased um, ecologically, so have uh, admissions to inpatient substance use disorder treatment programs for opioid use disorder. And it's you know, now estimated that there are about two and a half million people um, who are living with hepatitis C or active chronic hepatitis C in the United States. So those who are viremic, um, so not just antibody positive for hepatitis C, but actually we have you know, RNA, um, and of those two and a half million, it's estimated about 70% um, of those um, you know, are probably acquired hepatitis C through injection drug use. Um, and despite you know, having uh, this esti estimation of two and a half million who are living with hepatitis C, only about 36% are aware. And of, and of that two and a half million who are living with hepatitis C, only about 11% were treated um, as of 2018, um, despite having you know, great medications, the direct acting antivirals, as you can see um, in the next bar over, with cure rates that are you know, close to 100%. And it's thought, you know, this is everyone um, living with hepatitis C, and these rates one of those that are aware and two those that are treated are probably even lower um, in people who inject drugs. All right, so how, how do we combat all of these complications? Um, and I think the first place that we need to start um, is, with, is with the language that we use um, related to addiction. And this, is, um, this comes from the Recovery Research Institute. There glossary of addiction-related uh, terms um, that, um, that uh, propagate stigma. You know, and stigma prevents our patients from uh, 
disclosing substance use to us, um, but also disclosing when they're struggling more or after a period of not using, uh, when they've started to use again. So I think it's really important to use person-first language um, you know, to decrease stigma, that rather calling someone an abuser or a user or an addict or a junkie, that we refer to individuals with substance use disorder as someone who suffers from addiction or suffers from a substance use disorder or from an opioid use disorder. And then you know, using proper medical terms um, for positive or negative test results instead of um, saying that someone's urine is clean or dirty, say that it's positive or negative um, or expected or now is expected as we do for any other uh, laboratory test that we run. Right. And now on uh, to some preventive care um, for people who inject drugs. And some of these um, I'll go into more detail in, in later slides. But first, we should be screening everyone um, with a history of injection drug use for HIV and hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and then vaccinate, vaccinating those who are not immune um, to hepatitis A and B, and also providing uh, vaccination for tetanus or um, clostridium tetani because tetanus spores can actually, um, you know, dirt if they live in soil and soil can um, contaminate the drugs or, you know, the injection equipment. So really important to, to vaccinate folks every 10 years for tetanus. Um, we should counsel about the risks associated with sharing injection equipment. Um, we should educate about safer injection practices. We should teach opioid overdose prevention and prescribe naloxone um, to prevent fatal overdose. We should provide access to sterile needles and syringes. We should distribute condoms and screen for sexually transmitted infections. Again, because this, pa this patient population may be participating in sex work uh, or in high-risk sexual uh, behaviors. Um, we should prescribe medication-assisted treatment. We should prescribe PrEP for HIV prevention, um, provide access to supervised injection facilities, and finally, educate about early signs of infection related to injection drug use. Um, so tell our patients that the first sign of a fever or some skin redness that they should come to see us so that we can prevent um, these infections from, from progressing. Okay, so first, um, let's talk about HIV in this population. So we know that treatment for HIV, you know, and all people who inject drugs who are um, living with HIV should be offered treatment because it's dramatically increased quality of life and life expectancy in individuals living with HIV. We know that when people um, are on HIV medications and they're virally suppressed, that prevents sexual transmission um, of HIV to uninfected partners. Um, it's unknown, but um, treatment also likely reduces transmission via sharing in, uh, in syringes and other injection equipment. Um, and not only should we be prescribing um, treatment for HIV in this population, but we should be initiating it rapidly. And what rapid initiation means, you know, it means different things you know, depending on the context, but um, can mean starting someone on HIV medicine the day that they receive an HIV diagnosis, or at the very least on you know, the day of their first treatment visit. Um, and in a randomized controlled trial in South Africa, Participants, participants randomized to same day antiretroviral therapy initiation were significantly more likely to be virally suppressed at 10 months. Um, so clearly that you know, reduces the community viral load. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, we know that when someone is virally suppressed, they cannot transmit HIV to others. So to, you know, particularly people who are injecting drugs and using um, multiple times a day and potentially sharing injection equipment multiple times a day, you know, this intervention is, is particularly important, um, you know, in light of the new HIV outbreaks that we're seeing. And, you know, we think that people are injecting more frequently than they did um, with heroin in the past because fentanyl has a shorter duration of action uh, requiring people, you know, to inject more frequently than they may have in the past um, with heroin. Um, there was a similar study in Haiti with same-day initiation of ART, and that resulted in significantly increased retention in care 
and viral suppression at 10 months, and a pilot study um, from San Francisco in 39 individuals suggested that initiating ART on the same day of HIV diagnosis might modestly shorten the time to achieving viral suppression. And based on um, this pilot study in San Francisco, the city of San Francisco implemented the citywide program of you know, rapid initiation of ART. Um, and you can see in like, the blue um, uh, uh, table there that the median days. So first, you know, when they initiated this in 2013, you see when people were diagnosed to the first care uh, visit took about eight days. And by 2017, after implementing this program, they had shortened that to four. And they also shortened um, the median days um, from the first care visit to starting ART. So you know, in 2013, it was about a month, and they were able to reduce that to zero um, by 2017. So people started antiretrovirals during their first visit, um, and you know that resulted in uh, rapper, rapid, more rapid viral suppression. So you can see in 2013, it took about 70 days from that first prescription of antiretrovirals to someone achieving a viral load less than 200, and they're able to decrease that. Um, to 46 by, by 46 days by 2017. And then finally, um, from diagnosis to viral load suppression, um, they were able to reduce that from 134 down to 92 days. Um, and you know, this program, uh, they've noted it was highly ac acceptable to um, patients. And at a year after um, initiating this, you know, patients initiating ART as part of this program, 96% um, had still achieved viral suppression at, at one year. Right. And this is um, our, our program here in Philadelphia. So about six years ago, um, Philadelphia Fight Community Health Centers, the, the federally qualified health center um, that I work for, we developed a clinical collaboration with Prevention Point Philadelphia, which is um, our syringe service program here in Philadelphia. So we actually decided to locate an HIV clinic within Prevention Point Philadelphia. Um, really, at the time, you know, there were a dearth of services um, uh, in this zip code, 19134 in Philadelphia, a dearth, a dearth of services for individuals um, living with HIV with a history of injection drug use and you know the Puerto Rican flag on our, our postcard here um, you know, is indicative of the fact that there's also a lot of Puerto Ricans living in this neighborhood who, who also you know of, of people of Puerto Rican descent um, living with HIV uh, with a history of injection drug use who also did not have um, adequate service you know, access to HIV care and some of our strategies um, when we embarked on this project and starting this clinic, um, you know, first we, we built on decades of Prevention Point Philadelphia's expertise in harm reduction strategies and established trust in the community um, in North Philadelphia where, where this clinic is located. And we combined that um, with decades of Philadelphia Fights expertise in, in providing high quality HIV and hepatitis C care. And we really brought the clinic to the epicenter, that so we located it in the epicenter of the co-occurring HIV, hepatitis C, and opioid epidemics in Philadelphia, and you know, decided to co-locate medical services, social services, harm reduction services, all under one roof so that our patients didn't need to prioritize one life-sustaining intervention over another, and we provide flexible appointment scheduling so individuals can walk in not only for follow-up visits but also for new patient visits. Um, we get medication delivered from a pharmacy that we partner with um, so and that gets delivered on site to Prevention Point and, and Clinic of Star. and then um, with the help of my great team there um, our patients have an option for daily or weekly directly observed therapy for their um, HIV meds and their hepatitis C meds, but, but also all of their, their meds. And with all of these efforts, um, you know, we're really proud to say that we have very high retention and care rates and viral suppression rates. Um, and you know, these are our rates 
um, between 2013 to 2018. So these are retention and care rates um, at a year after someone um, enters care with us. So 85% retention in care rates and an 83% viral suppression rate. So that's less than 200 um, copies of the virus per, per milliliter of blood. Um, and you can compare those to the city of Philadelphia in uh, overall in 2016. Um, so far higher rates, you know, 46% retention rates and 51% viral suppression rates in, in the city of Philadelphia overall. And we've achieved these retention rates and these viral suppression rates um, despite taking care of a very marginalized patient population. Um, so our average age is 43.2 years, 81% um, identify as male, but 40% report being homeless in the previous month, 44% reported that they went hungry in the previous week, 51% um, reported feeling very depressed in the previous week, 15% of our participants are um, incarcerated at any given uh, month, um, and at the time when we started out, um, most of our patients, 89%, were out of care at the time that they um, entered care with us, and that was defined as being out of care for a six-month period um, during the last two years, um, and only 11% were newly diagnosed. Um, but with the numbers that I, I showed you in the you know, few previous slides on new HIV infections in Philadelphia, actually you know, more recently, I would say within the last year, we've been seeing more new diagnoses uh, relative to people who were, were not currently engaged. All right, so now I'm um, on to hepatitis C treatment in uh, people who inject drugs. And I've, only, I've already showed you can, the um, really unfortunate um, treatment numbers and the very low treatment numbers um, overall in people living with hepatitis C in the United States, which are probably even lower in, in people who inject drugs. And just, you know, despite um, the evidence that shows that clinical trials among people who inject drugs reporting current injection drug use at the start of therapy um, for hepatitis C um, or you know, had ongoing uh, injection drug use or opiate use disorder during therapy still demonstrated very high SVR, sustained virologic response or cure rates that approach 95%, which are you know, very similar to the general population living with hepatitis C and a cohort study of 89 patients treated for hepatitis C in a primary care clinic in New York City found that regardless of active substance use, um, SVR rates are greater than 95%. So here you have clinical trial data and, and real world data, both um, demonstrating that, that this population can take these meds and achieve um, uh, adequate cure. Um, and then you know, the other concern you know, besides um, you know, of not treating this population that you know, individuals who are actively using might, you know, are not able to adhere um, to meds, which we've just debunked. But the other concern is, you know, if we treat people who are actively injecting drugs, that there's a high likelihood that they will get reinfected. Um, but that's not been borne out either. And um, so the rate of hepatitis C reinfection in people who inject drugs is lower. Um, on the order of 2.4 per 100 person years of follow-up um, is lower compared to the incident rate in the general population, which is somewhere between 6.1 and 27.2 per 100 person years. And you know, reinfection rates are even lower um, if we prescribe medication-assisted treatment um, to individuals who are injecting drugs to prevent um, using again and prevent um, reinfection. We should also be prescribing PrEP um, to individuals who inject drugs, and this is recommended by um, the CDC, um, and the indications are an adult or adolescent person without acute or established HIV infection and with any injection of drugs, even once in the past six months. That combined with um, one of the following, so any sharing of injection drug preparation equipment in the past six months um, or um, the you know, risk of sexual acquisition, so um, you know, the risk of um, high risk of sexual behavior. And the CDC recommends daily continuous pre-exposure prophylaxis with TDF 
and FTC. Um, and this is based on one study um, called the Bangkok tenofovir study. And in this study, PrEP with tenofovir. So this was tenofovir, um, not uh, tenofovir plus FTC, but with tenofovir alone um, that reduced the risk of HIV acquisition in people who inject drugs by 49%. Um, and in separate analyses, um, in participants who were known to be taking tenofovir. So in those that had adequate blood levels for tenofovir, that risk declined um, to 74%. Um, and despite, um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, very good control or very good prevention of, of HIV with PrEP, um, in a study in Baltimore, only 25% of PrEP eligible PWID um, had actually heard of PrEP. Um, and 63% though of the sample that was uh, surveyed were interested in taking it, but only 2% um, were currently receiving it or, or being prescribed it. Um, and in this study, some of the barriers to PrEP utilization um, that were identified include low PrEP knowledge, low perceived HIV risk, negative experience with healthcare providers, concerns about side effects, competing health priorities, homelessness, um, criminal justice system involvement, and HIV-related stigma. And as I discussed earlier with um, the patients that we see at Clinic of Vienna Star, you know, obviously these are a lot of the barriers, same barriers to taking HIV meds, and you know, we've demonstrated with the with the correct supports in place, this population can take medicines and take them every day. Um, so now um, on to the DISCOVER trial, which is um, a, a study that compared FTC TAF or DISCOVI to FTC TDF or Travada um, uh, for PrEP. And the study was conducted um, in cisgender men who have sex with men and transgender women. And based on this study, um, the FDA recently approved Discovi um, for the use of PrEP, but just in um, cisgender men who have sex with men and transgender women, um, because it has not been studied in cisgender women. So basically we don't know um, its protection in the vaginal mucosa. Um, it also has not been studied um, in you know, specifically in, in people who inject drugs, um, but in the coming slides, I'll talk to you, you know, about why it may be particularly useful in this population. Um, but anyway, um, they enrolled um, 5,387 individuals and they were randomized to either FTC TAF or FTC TDF. Um, and the outcomes, um, there was, uh, a 53% reduction in um, new HIV infections in the FTC TAF group compared to FTC TDF. And these are small numbers, um, 15 in the FTC TDF group compared to seven in the FTC TAF group. But based on um, these results, uh, it's deemed that FTC TAF is not inferior to FTC TDF. Um, when used as, as PrEP. And the individuals in this study were all deemed very high risk for HIV acquisition. And you know, just to uh, the inclusion criteria to be included in this study, individuals um, had to have to report at least two episodes of condomless anal, anal sex within the past 12 months, or uh, rectal gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis um, within the past uh, 24 weeks. Um, and this, um, Next is some pharmacokinetic data, which I think is um, you know, important when we're talking about using Discovi um, for PrEP in people who inject drugs. Um, so first, if you look at um, the bold um, caption here of steady state in uh, PBMCs, um, tenofovir levels were 6.3 fold higher um, in the FTC TAF group versus um, the FTC TDF group. Um, which is really important you know, when we're talking um, about preventing HIV infection in people who inject drugs. Um, and not only that, but modeling found that concentrations, uh, so the EC90 concentration um, was six, it last for 16 days after the final dose in FTC-TAF versus 10 days 
after FTC TDF, and they, that you know that suggests that um, in people who miss a few doses of of Descovy, it, you know, it's more forgiving to miss a few doses of Descovy than Travada, um, which I think is you know, very important um, in people who inject drugs who um, you know, may be struggling with with adherence. And then finally, um, this looked at how quickly um, do individuals achieve um, a concentration above the EC90? So when are they protected um, from HIV acquisition? Um, and this compared uh, FTC TAF or Descovy to FTC TDF or Travada. And um, FTC TDF in orange below, um, it took <clears throat> um, four, sorry, three days to achieve the ECD-90 compared to one to two hours um, with FTC-TAF, and all achieved uh, a concentration above the EC-90 uh, within four hours. Uh, and I think you know, this is you know, particularly important because um, you know, individuals who inject drugs, as I, I mentioned, are injecting more frequently because of fentanyl. And it's very nice to know that after that first dose, within an hour or two, they're protected um, from ac HIV acquisition compared to four days um, with, with Travada. All right, so on to um, you know, some other um, safer in injection techniques. Um, so um, folks should be educated to always wash their hands and clean the area to be injected with an alcohol swab. Um, patients should be educated to never share needles, syringes, tourniquets, cookers, waters, or filters. Um, patients would always inject toward the heart at a 15 to 35 degree angle. Veins in the arms are, are preferred over the legs. Um, individuals should use different arms and different veins so as not to you know, always um, aggravate the same vein. Um, we should, patients should use sterile or boiled water, again, you know, boiled for at least 10 minutes. Um, patients should be educated to prepare their own clean area for use away from others. Um, and to never reuse needles. And um, these um, techniques uh, are adapted from Getting Off Right, um, the Getting Off Right Safety Manual. Um, that's a manual that's uh, published by the Harm Reduction Coalition and, and written by consumers and service providers um, together. Um, and so, you know, <clears throat> the reason to, you know, <laughs> other than um, to prevent transmission of infection, viruses, and bacteria and fungi, to never re reuse needles is that you can see after just one use how barbed and distorted the needle becomes. You know, before use, it's very um, pointed needle, and then after one use and six uses, um, how distorted the needle becomes. And this effectively turns a very small bore needle into a larger and larger bore needle, um, which can then more effectively transmit bacteria and fungi and viruses. We should be referring um, everyone who inject drugs um, to syringe service programs. Um, they have been shown to reduce the rates of HIV and hepatitis C, um, and they do not, um, they've not been shown to increase drug use, the number of people who inject drugs, or needles discarded in, in an unsafe manner. Um, and for parts of the country that do not have access um, to syringe service programs, um, medical providers in the District of Columbia and all 50 states, um, except Delaware and Kansas, are legally allowed to uh, prescribe um, syringes and needles, and pharmacies are legally allowed to dispense them. And at the bottom of the screen is um, a website um, from uh, Temple Law School here in Philadelphia that actually lists the exact policies by state, um, if anyone um, finds that useful. We should be prescribing um, naloxone or Narcan to all of our patients uh, to prevent opioid overdose and educating um, our patients and their families and friends on its use. Um, this is a sign that um, I developed for uh, the health centers um, in really kind of destigmatize um, the, the prescribing. And, you know, we discuss um, Narcan prescribing with all of our patients, um, you know, independent of um, what op if they're prescribed opioids um, by prescription or if they have a history of opioid use, 
um, and it's you know a great opportunity to educate patients about um, what increases their risk of overdose. So, you know, I tell patients that if they have a history of COPD, um, if that worsens, that same dose of oxycodone that they're prescribed, you know, even if they're not um, using, you know, if they're even they're following the prescription, that anything that you know, further compromises their respiratory function can increase their risk of opioid overdose. So, you know, COPD exacerbation or um, getting the flu or pneumonia, all of those things, um, even if they're still taking their medicine and prescribed, can increase their overdose risk. And at Clinica Vienni Star, um, we pair um, their monthly HIV meds or hepatitis C meds with a box of Narcan. So when they pick their meds up from us, from us each month, they automatically get a refill of Narcan. Uh, we should be increasing access to medication-assisted treatment. Um, we should prescribe buprenorphine, oral naltrexone, or long-acting injectable naltrexone, or refer um, our patients to methadone maintenance. Um, we know that buprenorphine and methadone significantly reduce opioid use. They increase treatment retention, and they decrease overall mortality. Also, HIV um, and hepatitis C incidents are decreased um, you know, with participation and longer duration in, in methadone maintenance programs. Um, but you know, despite all this, according to a 2015 analysis based on data um, from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, only about 20% of individuals with an opioid use disorder in the U.S. Um, who could benefit from MAT actually received it. Uh, we should be testing for fentanyl in urine and drug samples um, and, and make sure that um, the urine drug screens um, that we are using actually test for fentanyl. Um, because fentanyl you know, has not only been found to be mixed into heroin or completely replaced heroin, but it's found um, here in Philadelphia and elsewhere to adulterate cocaine, methamphetamine, MDMA, marijuana, K2, or synthetic um, cannabinoids, and even pressed into counterfeit prescription pills. Um, and you know, many of our patients may be unaware that fentanyl is used in an adulterant in, in the drugs that they're using and might rely on ineffectual information, including the smell of a drug, the taste, the color, or word of mouth um, for the presence of fentanyl. Um, and so again, it's important to use rapid and confirmatory urine drug screens you know, that inform our decisions um, you know, and, and education with patients that include fentanyl and uh, its metabolite nor fentanyl. And you know, we should also be distributing rapid, uh, rapid fentanyl test strips to any patients that want them um, to actually test the drug sample. So the drug sample can be, a little bit of the drug sample can be diluted with some water and um, these strips can be used, the patients can actually test the drug sample um, and they're used for the qualitative detection of fentanyl and, and its metabolite nor fentanyl. And these test strips, when used um, on illicit drug uh, samples, have demonstrated 96 to 100 percent sensitivity and 90 to 98 specificity, um, when, especially when compared to the gold standard, um, which is gas uh, chromatography mass spectrometry. All right, and then finally, um, we should be um, uh, you know, instituting and referring patients to supervised injection facilities. Um, and these provide individuals with substance use disorders a medically monitored and legally sanctioned environment to more safely engage in injection drug use. Um, they're designed to keep people who inject drugs alive long enough for them to engage um, in treatment for substance use disorder. And um, around the world, they're known as supervised injection sites, safe injection sites, fixed rooms, safer injection facilities, drug consumption facilities, and medically supervised injection centers. And the reason for the difference in terminology is really based on the substances that are allowed to be used in these facilities. And some um, permit uh, individuals to just inject and use uh, substances intranasally. Others allow substances to be smoked. Um, here in Philadelphia, we're um, moving 
um, toward opening the first legally sanctioned in the U.S., um, which will be called an opioid um, overdose prevention site. Um, but anyway, the first one first operated, uh, began operating in Bern, Switzerland, um, all the way back in 1986, and it was in response um, to increasing HIV infections and drug-related overdoses at the time in Switzerland. Um, there are now over 100 legally sanctioned SIFs in 10 countries and 66 cities in Europe, Australia, and Canada, um, but currently no legally sanctioned facility exists in the U.S. Um, so, what are some of the services that are provided at SIFS? So, again, they permit the injection of pre-obtained illicit drugs under the supervision of, of medical staff. Um, they differ by site, but these facilities typically provide supplies necessary to inject drugs in a sterile manner. Um, they offer overdose response. They provide basic medical care, including wound care, and they offer safe injecting education and refer patients to um, substance use disorder treatment. Many also offer HIV and hepatitis C screening and administer vaccinations. So not only do these facilities help keep people alive by preventing overdose, so there have been um, thousands of overdoses in, in these facilities worldwide um, since they opened in 1986 and and beyond, but never a single fatal overdose in any of these facilities. And um, in the cities worldwide where these have opened, not only um, have overdoses been prevented or fatal overdoses been prevented within the facilities themselves, but within the surrounding communities. So not only are people injecting more safely within these facilities, but that spills out into the surrounding communities. Um, and then also these facilities are offering all these other medical services that these very marginalized patients often don't have access to. So I really see them as a gateway um, you know, to, you know, I mean, they're not only protection from fatal overdose, but also a gateway to other medical services and substance use treatment. Um, so what are some of the benefits to the individual of, of uh, these facilities? So studies from Europe, Canada, Australia suggest that SIFs are associated with a reduction in drug overdose deaths, as I've mentioned. They're associated with safer injection practices, uh, which are known to reduce HIV and hepatitis C transmission and the acquisition of um, serial, serious infections um, from bacteria and fungi. They're effective referral sites, again, for substance use disorder treatment and also um, primary medical care. And they have benefits to the community as well. Um, so the use of SIFs associated with decreased public injection and increased safe syringe disposal, and they've not been shown to lead to increased drug use, um, to increased crime or increased drug trafficking um, in their surrounding communities. Um, and that's where I will end. Um, here are my uh, references. Okay, that was um, absolutely excellent, Dr. Bamford. Um, wonderful information. Uh, let me just end with a couple of things on the grant. And first, I do want to say we do have a question box open. So if you do have any questions, you are welcome to type in the question box and ask your question and we will answer them. Uh, the provider clinical support system through the grant does have a mentoring program for all types of professionals. Uh, it's designed to offer general information to clinicians about evidence-based clinical practices and prescribing medications for opioid addiction. Um, PCSS Mentors are a national network of providers with expertise in addictions, pain, evidence-based treatment, including medication-assisted treatment. They utilize a three-tiered approach, allowing every mentor and mentee relationship to be unique and catered to the specific needs of the mentee. There's no cost to this. It is funded by the grant. And for more information, you can visit the website that's listed. We can go to the next slide. And if you do have a uh, clinical question, um, you also can, you know, ask that question now. Again, you can um, also post that in our question box. 
in the next slide. And this is a collaborative effort by the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, and you can see the uh, partnerships that are part of this grant, trying to educate people on the opioid epidemic. And of course, uh, you can see us, which is on the right side in the center, the International Nurses Society on Addictions. Now again, just a um, reminder, you will receive um, an evaluation with four, within four hours of this webinar and then uh, PCSS will send you a completion certificate. That is not the continuing education certificate. The continuing education certificate will be emailed to you approximately two weeks after the webinar. So please don't call asking where your CE certificate is, that will be coming. And with that, um, I'm gonna go to some of the questions here. Uh, let me see. Uh, and I think maybe Robert may be able to help me, but I'm not seeing the questions. Robert, could you pose the questions? Okay. Um, how are they getting brain abscesses? Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, the bacteria or fungi get into the bloodstream, and um, it, you know, the bacteria can go anywhere. Um, and what, where it seeds, you know, whether it's the brain. Um, or a joint you know, is not entirely clear, but um, yeah, this is how it, it gets there. Okay, next question, Robert. Okay, it looks like some, it looks like some people had trouble hearing the audio. So um, for those of you who couldn't hear it, there will be an archive that we'll put up in a couple hours um, and we'll send the link out that to everybody uh, as soon as we can. Uh, yeah, next question also was, this, this okay. also gets posted on the um, American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry website as well. It will also be there where you can listen to it as well. So you have two spots to listen to it. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Robert. Oh, that's okay. Uh, let's see. Um, as a therapist, can we advise one on always inject toward the heart at a 15 to 35 degree angle? I mean, that's I mean, that's the recommended, so that the like the bevel of the needle is causing the the least amount of trauma, um, you know, through the skin and into the vein. So yes, <laughs> I think anyone, you know, any, and it doesn't have to be just um, a medical provider. I think you know whoever has contact, uh, you know, all of the information presented here, whoever has contact with this patient population, it's important, and um, even some of our phlebotomists here at Philadelphia Fight have an interest and in, it's the perfect time when someone's sitting in a phlebotomy chair um, and, you know, for the phlebotomist to demonstrate, you know, pos you know um, correct techniques for venipuncture, uh, I think is a great opportunity um, for, for phlebotomists to um, talk about cleaning the skin appropriately and injecting at the right angle um, and using a tourniquet. I think anyone can be doing this, whoever comes in contact with, with this patient population. Okay, is there any incorporation of acupuncture or acudetox? Uh, yeah, we haven't yet, and I think I think that would be great, and mostly because in Pennsylvania, um, you know, a lot of um, alternative medicine isn't covered by Medicaid, you know, most of the patients we see are Medicaid, but um, that would be great if we, we could do that. Okay. What if the patient is diagnosed with HIV and started on ART the same day? Is the genotype done to determine treatment? Is there a rapid genotype or is this not done anymore? Yeah. So standard of care um, is still to, to get a genotype, you know, so... Um, I'll uh, see someone based on mostly on on a, it's an INSTE test, so it's a third generation just HIV antibody test. And you know, given in this patient population, the the pretest probability is so high. Um, I will send off all the blood work that day, which includes an HIV genotype, CD4 count, HIV viral load, complete metabolic panel. Um, and um, a fourth generation HIV test, you know, for confirmation. 
Um, but you know, we pick medicines that we know um, are not, you know, are not transmitted from one person to another. So uh, integrase inhibitors and protease inhibitors, if, if selected as the initial regimen, um, we've not seen any transmitted resistance with those. And so we think safe to start. And um, I think more important to get people on to medications as quickly as possible to, to decrease the community viral load and transmission to others. But also I think um, starting someone that first day, you're um, immediately developing a rapport and you're saying to this person in front of you that, you know, I um, care very much about your health and I care so much that I'm going to start you on medications today. Um, and I, you know, just anecdotally in our, in our experience, patients I think are coming back, you know, um, with greater frequency um, after they've received that, that medication that day. Okay. Are other alternative therapies used to help reduce use? Um, yeah. So sometimes, I mean, so we're using, I don't know if it means medications, but um, in addition to medication-assisted treatment, um, sometimes I will pair those um, with medications to treat the opioid uh, withdrawal symptoms themselves. Um, so we are using that. We are referring individuals um, to therapy. Um, in either individual or in uh, intensive outpatient treatment programs that involve groups several days a week or therapy, uh, so definitely. Okay. What is hindering the United States from providing these safe injection facilities and services, and what do you think we can do about it? Yeah, uh, great question. So, uh, um, so you know, I can speak from the experience in Philadelphia, and I was fortunate enough to be able to um, – to testify at the evidentiary hearing for our proposed um, opioid prevention site, opioid overdose prevention site here in Philadelphia. So the um, legal um, reasoning um, in Philadelphia on why uh, these facilities couldn't open was based on a 1986 um, Controlled Substance Act, which you know was colloquially called the Crack House Act it pretty much stated that individuals can't congregate within a single facility or building to use, sell, share um, illicit substances. Um, but that, um, that argument was actually overruled by um, you know, the judge here in, in Philadelphia who ruled on this. So there's been one hurdle, um, but um, that's only you know one piece of um, kind of the legal arguments from the Department of Justice, and um, you know I don't I don't you know I don't understand you know someone who is a harm reductionist and someone who's lost um, over two dozen patients in the last few years um, to fatal overdoses when I haven't lost a single patient to HIV or hepatitis C. Um, why you know despite all that we're doing, um, and we're still seeing these exorbitant overdose deaths, um, why we aren't considering doing something more extraordinary. Okay, uh, how do you treat cocaine abuse? Uh, um, <laughs> um, so, you know, in, in my patients, um, you know, a lot are, are using, um, a lot are using both, you know, cocaine and uh, heroin slash fentanyl. So often when um, we treat the opioid use disorder with medication-assisted treatment, the cocaine use uh, declines. Um, you know, I have used other medications, which, um, you know, none of which are um, uh, FDA approved for um, treatment of cocaine use disorder, but we've tried <clears throat> pyramid and um, sertraline and, you know, um, with, with some success to, to reduce cravings. Okay, so there's three more here right now. So the first one is um, seeing the marginalized population is disenfranchised with poor experiences in hospitals. How will you liaise between the population and accessing services? Yeah, so, right, I mean, that's still a concern. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, from past experience and an ongoing experience, and we try, you know, I, 
because um, I'm also faculty uh, within the University of Pennsylvania Health System, whenever my patients need to be admitted to the hospital or see a specialist, I try to call ahead and, and you know, speak to the providers who will be taking care of them in the hospital um, or in a specialty appointment and to try to discuss their history and um, you know, and just be available, um, you know, to discuss uh, the, the case um, if if the patient is really struggling. Um, we have um, care navigators. Uh, we're very fortunate at Philadelphia Fight to have care navigators who can go with patients to specialty appointments and advocate for them. Um, and, you know, I think patients are treated very differently when there's somebody else in the room who's advocating for them. Um, so those are you know two two solutions that we've tried. Okay. Um, so do the clients have to pay to go to these clinics to inject or use their drugs? Um, no, they are they are free and and the at least the proposed one in Philadelphia. Um, so I can't speak for the rest of the world, but because um, I think the ones. Uh, and I can't speak for the rest of the world, but the proposed one in, in Philadelphia would be um, privately funded, and so uh, patients would not have to um, pay to actually inject. Now, to access some of the other services, um, to, um, to access medication-assisted treatment um, at these sites, either you know on-site at these sites or referral to these sites, um, referral to other sites, they would need insurance uh, to be able to access other treatment. Yeah, you know, for HIV, hepatitis C, medication-assisted treatment. Okay, and um, uh, what are your recovery rates from opioid use? Oh, I think probably um, in the same as um, you know the rest of the country. Um, they're you know they're um, probably you know, forty to sixty percent you know of, of people who continue to relapse and remit um, but you know if, if you look at diabetes or asthma or hypertension um, we probably we see the same rates and so um, you know I think what it speaks to is that you know um, we just need lifelong vigilance and and people need to be on treatment for far longer than um, perhaps you know we've been doing in the past. Okay, and, you know, there's I, one I more tell, here. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, let's say I, I tell my patients that the duration that they should be on medication-assisted treatment is the duration that they need it. And, and if that's the rest of their life, then that's the rest of their life in the same way that um, people may need blood pressure medicines or treatment for diabetes the rest of their life. Okay, one more question came in. She came into the webinar a little late, so if it's addressed earlier, we she, we can just refer her to the uh, recording. But the question is, uh, any insight into fentanyl use disorder? Uh, I find the patients I have seen consistently continue to use fentanyl in spite of being on methadone or buprenorphine treatment. Yeah, and, and we're, we're seeing that too. I know I think um, because uh, fentanyl you know, binds with higher affinity to the opioid receptor and, um, you know, is more potent. Um, yeah, we found, we, we're finding that it's taking patients far longer to stop using. Um, and, um, you know, when, when it comes to buprenorphine, sometimes we've needed to make the transition to methadone um, so that you can continue to increase the dose and in, increase the saturation of the opioid receptors. Um, you know, but I also think that, you um, even if you're reducing someone's use, even if it's taking a, a long time, you're, you're reducing their fatal overdose risk. And so, even if they're still continuing to use, um, you may they may maybe only be using half the time or a third of the time, and you've dramatically decreased their uh, overdose um, risk and also their risk of acquiring HIV, hepatitis C, and, and serious and other serious bacterial and fungal infections. Great. That it, Robert? That's it. Okay. Well, Dr. Bamford, thank you so much. This was an excellent presentation. We appreciate so much you taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to share it with everyone who was on the call. We also thank everyone for being on the call. I know I learned a lot. I think it was an excellent presentation, and we're very grateful to you. 
Um, just a reminder to everyone, you will receive an evaluation within about uh, four hours after this webinar. Again, you will receive a certificate of completion. That's not your CE certificate. The CE certificate will arrive in about two weeks from now. Thank you for being here, and we will now end the webinar.